Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have the incredible, the indisputable, the bombshell of the month for May, Brooklyn Gray. Hi, Holly. I'm so excited to be back for a full length podcast this time. I know. So for those of you who aren't aware, I did do a mini interview with Brooklyn at the AVN show, um, not last year, because we were in a pandemic, but the year before that. And it's a really, really great one. Um, and I knew after I did that interview that I had to have her come in for a full length interview because she's so smart and funny and insightful and kinky and pervy and all of the wonderful <laughs> things that we love in our guests. So she's back. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to have you here because I've always, you know, I remember the first time we met, uh, we were shooting at a location in Beverly Hills and you showed up to set and you were wearing a Led Zeppelin shirt. And I was <laughs> like, this girl, I love this girl. And I shot it with Jenna right. Fox and it yeah, was amazing. And I, I tell people about that shoot all the time because she and I, that was the girl crush. So it was like, mm -hmm. who do you want to work with? Why little interview? There's some sort of like um connection to some degree but she and I had never met before that shoot and then we met on that set and now we're really close friends I was actually just with her yesterday so that was that was a catalyst to a really wonderful friendship which was a super cool thing to happen coming from a set yeah Jenna's uh Jenna's a lot of fun Jenna has also been bombshell of the month um last year I think late last year so we love Jenna um, so Brooklyn, I guess let's, um, I'm going to kind of start with the question that I ask most of my guests, just because it's, uh, the one question that everybody kind of wants to know and usually leads into some interesting stories. How did you get started in the adult industry? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> um, I was prior to moving to LA, I was living in Chicago and I was kind of in limbo. I was, I majored in musical theater in college for a hot second, um, not for very long, but I had always kind of had it in the back of my mind that porn sounded like something that I might be interested in doing, might want to do. I was like, telling people when I was like 16 that I was like, Hey, maybe I'll do this one day. And no one really believed me. Cause I don't know. People are like, Oh, I'm going to be a stripper. Oh, I'm going to do porn. Everyone takes it pretty lightly. But I was in Chicago. I had dropped out of school cause I was not enjoying the school environment. And I was kind of like doing a few things in between trying to figure out where I wanted to be. And then I was like, you know, I've always had this idea. And maybe I should try to pursue it. So I created a social, I created a Twitter and I kind of found the sex work community through Twitter. I like found OnlyFans girls and found people who were like camming and like selling content. And I kind of wanted to jump in head first. And I found some people who were shooting real hardcore mainstream porn. And so I reached out to them and I was like, hey, I would really like to try this. And I got hooked up with my first shoot, which was one of those like very exploitative new girl shoots. Everyone does their first one. It's a little seedy, but I ended up really liking it and I shot and then I ended up flying out to Vegas and doing a lump sum of shoots. And then I came to LA and I never ended up leaving. Hmm. What was that first scene like? Were you nervous going into it? Can you say maybe who you worked with? Yeah, um, it was in Arizona. It was for exploited college girls. <laughs> so <it laughs> so was, when you said it was an exploitative <laughs> shoot, like literally like, it was actually, an exploitative shoot. Let me, who, who's this, how, where's this girl? How young is she? And how can we exploit her? Um I was actually really excited for my first shoot. I was not nervous at all. I was really stoked. Um, actually, <laughs> it's a funny story, and I don't think I've ever shared this with anybody, but I was still um, 
So I was living in Chicago and then I moved back home for a short period of time while I was like in between apartments and I ended up getting my first shoot when I was at home and I had to tell my parents that I was doing something completely different and I actually pulled it off, which is like wild to me because my parents were kind of on top of me as a kid. But um, so I made it out to Arizona under the radar and I did this shoot and I honestly don't remember who the talent was. I don't know if it's someone that's still industry or like does a lot of mainstream. I know those sites kind of sometimes have random guys here and there, but um, mm. I was really excited. I I came with my suitcase already. I brought all my slutty clothes and I, I guess that I thought it was going to be more high end. And when I got there, I realized like what it was and it was totally fine. But the one thing that I didn't realize, which I guess this is where the exploitation part comes in. I had no idea that they didn't cut anything. Like when you do a normal scene, they'll cut out the parts that shouldn't be in, you know, and they'll they'll make you look right. good to some like degree. Right, stop for lube or whatever. Yeah, right. just in general, you know, and they posted the entire thing. So I'm definitely, there's some moments that are just like not super fun to watch and definitely not super fun for me to know that are on the internet, but not the end of the world. And from that, I ventured out into more bigger and better things and more comfortable sets. But that was kind of my first introduction. Um, but everyone was really nice and everyone, I, I felt safe and I felt cared for to some degree. So I can't really complain. What was your first scene that you did that you really felt like, okay, this is kind of more of like the mainstream porn industry. This feels a little bit more high end, as you said, this feels like an industry that I want to really pursue a career in. I feel like I have two different answers to that question because my first actual mainstream shoot, not including that one, definitely I had a better idea of maybe what to expect going forward and an idea of how sets ran. So there was the first set that I was on that was kind of op that operated true to a normal, like a set that I'm on every day now. Um, and I think that was for... It was either a Team Skeet or it was a Porn Pros. So I was out of Vegas and I remember being on that set and like learning about girly stuff and learning about how to pose for pretty girls and learning just how it works on a, on a, on a regular set. The other one, Exploited College Girls was very much like, I know this girl is coming in and she has no idea what she's walking into. Let's make sure that like she's good and get going. Whereas on a normal set, you assume that two people are coming to set that have a rundown of what's going on, um, understand what they need to do. And um, actually my first, first mainstream um, shoot was my first girl, girl, which is kind of funny because I feel like most girls start out with a boy girl. Um, my second one was mm. a boy girl, but it was a girl girl and I never shot girl girl before, obviously. And I remember I wanted to do a really good scene, but I, I guess I had an idea of how to have porno sex with a man, but I wasn't sure how to have porno sex with a woman. Because if I ever watched lesbian porn, it was amateur real porn and like I understand how to open up for a camera when you're getting fucked with a dick but it's different when you're working with a woman I didn't know how to open up I wasn't sure like what positions are good for camera I feel like it's harder to a degree if you don't know what you're getting into like everyone knows mish doggy spoon like I can do all of the boy girl positions but going in I was like I don't know what to do for camera for a girl girl so I had to be walked through it and it ended up being a nice scene. I worked with, um, what was her name? Mia something. Hmm? Nope. It's not going to come to me, but she was really, really kind and she helped me out and it, it was a really great day. Oh, and then wait, you know, sorry. I'm, I'm glad that you my other tangent was the first set that I was like, man, I really want to be in this industry. I love this was, uh, swallowed.com 
they are one of my favorite sets to be on because you go into the bathroom and they have everything for you. Everything that you think you might need and even things that you might not think you need, they have it there. Everyone treats you like an absolute princess. Your feet don't touch the floor without like someone handing you water, someone handing you a towel, like getting everything you need. And I remember feeling... I feel so happy on those sets. You get to help pick out your outfit. You're really well taken care of. They make sure you look good, feel good. So that was a set that I was like, man, I love being here. That was also pretty early on in my career. And I, I've worked for them many times since then. And it's, it's, I've garnered a really wonderful relationship with them. So that's cool. Yeah. You touched on like two things that I kind of wanted to elaborate on or comment on a little bit. So The first thing about like your first girl, girl actually being more difficult than your first boy, girl. And my God, that is so true. It's actually much harder to shoot a girl, girl scene with an inexperienced girl than a boy, girl scene. Um, Getting the positions where you can see the face and the vagina and the tongue is, is tricky, you know, with a penis, like you've got some length there that creates like separation between the bodies. And especially if you're working with like, an experienced guy, he usually knows how to position the girl to kind of like get all the shots that you need. But with a girl, girl, it can be really tricky because it's like, you got to like lick sideways kind of like you can see, you know what I mean? Like you can see the tongue and 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 everything. It's also like transitioning between positions too. Yeah. Cause I, I I feel like if, especially like if you don't know what, what you're doing or what's going on, like, it's not just like you're not just sitting there eating pussy you're like having to switch positions and like doing the wraparounds and the spoons and it's like the doggy it's it's much harder to open up and I feel like it it the flow is much less efficient when you're not both on the same page and with it whereas a boy girl like you said a guy can position a girl in the right way and have it be good to go like my first boy girl that I did the guy was definitely helping me out and like had to move me and you don't have that luxury when you're doing a girl girl you kind of both have to be on the ball so the fact that that was my first mainstream shoot I was very intimidated but like I said, it ended up being a great day. And now I love doing girl, girl. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing you said about being on the swallow set and like being taken care of, I think that that's so important. You know, I also too like try to have everything on set that someone might need. Um, I used to do slippers and we stopped doing that, but maybe since you said, you know, your feet didn't touch the floor, I feel now like I got to bring my <laughs> slipper game back in. But, you know, I think, um, I think like little touches like that go a really long way, making the performer feel like they're taken care of, that like everything they might need is there, that they're, um, you know, being treated well, they're being attended to, they feel safe, they feel sexy, they feel heard. I think that's really important too. Um, and so that's, that's something I definitely strive for because I feel like, you know, my mom always taught me like, you're only as good as your model feels. That was like her kind of, um, motto. And I found that to be so great motto. Yeah. I wish that more people worked by that motto. I remember I was just recently on a set of yours and I looked at your box of things, (laughs) which has everything that someone could need. And I, I actually said something about it. I was, I always appreciate so much when I'm on a set and they have generally something, it doesn't need to be everything like swallowed goes above and beyond. And that's wonderful, but I don't expect everyone to do that, but it's cool when someone at least has like, the basics like I've been on a set and needed I had like an allergy problem in a set house and no one had like a Zyrtec or a Benadryl actually I had a set that I broke out in hives because we were outside and no one had Benadryl I was like you guys are gonna shoot us outside and no one has Benadryl that's I feel like that's That's, something that we might need to have I've had someone not even I always so important yeah it's like it's a health thing I've, I always bring my own mm-hmm. enemas to set if I'm doing anal, but I forgot one one day and they didn't have any. And I was like, this is like the, actually the only thing that I need this here is a today. Disaster. Like, <laughs> someone had to run and go get enemas. Yeah. And I was like, basic necessities, baby wipes, enema, douche bottle. Um, 
I don't know. There's also, you probably have a better idea, but there's just, it feels so nice to walk onto a set and without even, I don't even have to talk to anybody. If I see that there are things there for my accommodation and my health, I feel better already right off the bat. I'm like, okay, these people care. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's so important. Um, even like the basic stuff, like food, like it blows my mind how people don't have food on set. Like we have so much food. I'm always like, we need vegan. We need non-gluten. We need snacks. We need like vegetarian. I mean, how can you expect people to work 12 hour days? Because porn doesn't do overtime and they don't do catering because we don't have the budget for it. Like bring food for your people crazy to me yeah that's the other thing I hate being on sets that last if I'm there for hours and hours on end it's one thing if I'm in and out within a couple hours whatever yeah. I always bring like my Mike Quasar oh, my cannot God. have that Mike Quasar yeah. cannot have food on set because you're only there for like two hours so that's fine yeah and it's fine yeah amazing <gasps> love that um but yeah having snacks on set is I think really important Maybe mm-hmm. it's just me, but like I've been on set for 12, 13 hours at a time and been given like a granola bar. And I'm like, this is a lot for a granola bar. <laughs> I need a little more help. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about Brooklyn's bombshell of the month shoot, her Twisties Treat of the Month shoot, and her very uh, interesting, sexy kink fetishes. So hang tight. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, we are back. So Brooklyn, you recently did two shoots that... um, it's funny, both were produced by me, but neither one was shot by me, (laughs) but they were both amazing shoots. And, um, I guess let's start with the twisties treat of the month shoot. And just to explain to our audience, because a lot of you know her, um, Eva, uh, shot you for twisties treat of the month. Um, she's rebranded as Stella smut, just FYI. So if you guys are looking for her online, that's her new brand. Um, but yeah, so she did your twisties treat of the month shoot, which was quite a feat to pull off. I remember getting the script and being like, oh, fucking shit. They want like these huge swaths of fabric, like draped from like the ceiling. And it was a whole thing to get the location and and set everything up. And I felt really bad too, because like after, or when they were on set, I realized like you should have had an art director on set because like there was a lot to do and, and her and jordan and everybody yeah, else that had was to do a it. hefty job yeah it was too much they should have had an art director and i felt bad it, afterwards like i was like you guys should have had more people that was my bad i should have insisted on that but um but tell me about the shoot because it came out like, like every... fucking amazing oh i just watched the whole 
tr- the solo montage bit and it looks absolutely beautiful i like mm. could not have accounted for how beautifully this came out i i like want to share it all over the internet it's just not safe for work so i can't put clips on instagram but um that was a really incredible experience and like you said there was so much that went into it and being there that day it was a two-day shoot the first one was just the girl girl which was awesome because it was skateboard themed and I actually do skateboard and I felt like it was very much my vibe and very grungy very there was It was in a graffitied warehouse, like dirty, grimy, was so here for everything. I got to work with Ayla Donovan, who was also lovely. My first time meeting her and she is so sweet and so wonderful to perform with. Um, But the second day was when everything needed to happen in terms of art direction. So needless to say, it was a very long day, (laughs) but I'm surprised. But it it couldn't be too long. Well, because you guys couldn't go over 12 hours. Otherwise, the overtime was like insane. I was like, Eva, like, don't go over fucking 12 hours. Oh, yeah. It was like $300 an hour. One, and they are the kind of people that, no joke, if you go one minute over overtime, one fucking minute, they will charge you the whole hour. They never give you a break. Oh, They're shit. really strict about that. So I was like, this needs to be done in 12 hours. So they really yeah, we we if it was twelve hours, we were definitely there for a full twelve hours. There's no oh, yeah. way we we wrapped sooner than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I just remember we were starting the day, and I was upstairs. Rosalind did my makeup, and I was getting out wardrobe, and I could I hadn't worked with that crew yet, and I could kind of tell that everyone was was trying to tackle a lot and trying to figure out how the fuck we were supposed to do or they were supposed to do all of that in in an empty warehouse and I was trying to make it easier for people I know that my outfits needed to be picked out so I like laid out all my outfits and um I know that Eva now Stella was supposed to come upstairs and like help me pick out my outfit but it was taking a little longer than it was supposed to downstairs. So I thought it was being really helpful. And I grabbed a couple outfits and I went downstairs and I was like, Hey, I don't know if this is going to make it easier for you, but which one do you want to see on me? And I could tell that everyone was flustered because she was like, I need you to go back upstairs. Like I'll be with you in a moment, but this is a lot more than I think we all expected. So I was watching everyone work their asses off to, to make this huge fantasy of a set a reality and they did and um just watching it happen was was really cool and really inspiring because it's i i didn't even think that that would be possible and they i had seen pictures of what um they got on the script what it was supposed to look like and i was expecting it to be a good enough version i saw how daunting it looked to mm. set up and when i came downstairs and it was fully set up i was truly blown away the the lighting was Mm. incredible the the sheer fabric coming down in all different places was so cool and um the first look I got to be on a stage so they set up they built this entire stage and draped the fabrics down and I got to play in the fabrics and it felt it felt really good being up on that stage and having what it felt like stage lights and I it, the lights were so bright up there that I couldn't even see what was going on in the rest of the warehouse. So it kind of felt like I was in a different reality for a moment. It was very surreal, which was very cool. Um, there was a lot of fabric that day. There was fabric with the first look, and then there was <laughs> fabric that came off of my actual corset in the third look. And then I was tied up in ribbon for the third I think look. It was-, it was a very fabric forward day. Yeah. I think it was like five hundred dollars in fabric, like the, the cost. Oh, it's I, insane. I yeah. And I, you know, I have to say, I'm so glad that actually you ended up getting that concept because you are an incredible mover. Um, I, I, you have a dance background, right? Yes, I do. Y- yeah, you can tell, and the way that you moved was so gorgeous and 
really made this set work because, you know, and as much as it went into it, like you said, with like fabrics and lights and stuff, there actually wasn't really much to the set, you know, except for like the, the dramatic yeah. fabric and the light. So there wasn't like a bunch of props and like couches and things for you to work on. So it really was very focused on you and the way that you moved. And, um, I think if it had been anybody else, it would have been a waste of a set. And that's happened so many times where, you know, we put all this money and effort into building this really beautiful setup. And then the person that we shoot in that setup just doesn't have like the body confidence, the body awareness, just doesn't really like have like what it takes to really make that work. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it just yeah. ends up kind of being It's also a hard to try to take Yeah, it's also I mean, obviously body confidence and all that plays into it, but I feel like it's also really hard to bring life to a an overwhelming but stagnant space. It's a lot to look at and there's what is right in front of you is larger than life, but there's not much to it like you said. Yeah. Everything about the set is about framing you and your movements, you know, as, as opposed to it, like being a really cool looking bedroom set or something like that. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's really, everything is to frame you. And so like, if you weren't able to kind of bring that energy and that grace to that, it just would have like not really worked. So, so I have to say, and I said the same thing to Stella, um, when I was looking at the video, I was like, I'm so grateful it was Brooklyn because this would have been a waste on anybody else. So it just worked out perfectly. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. that makes me feel so good inside. <laughs> I also am really glad that I got that concept because I don't think that anyone has showcased me in a way that felt in a way that feels honest to me. Mm. And this shoot was a perfect example of that. I, I got to, like I said, the skater girl thing was totally up my vibe. The location totally up my alley and being able to incorporate some of my dance background and, and fill the space with movement is something that I always enjoy and appreciate. And I, I had a really great time with that. And I think I was, it was very truthful yeah. to me, which doesn't happen very often. Right, right. Um, okay, let's talk about your bombshell of the month interview or bombshell of the month shoot. I know you did an interview as well, um, which you guys can go see on my YouTube channel, by the way. So yeah, tell me a little bit about that because I know that you and Stella kind of um collaborated a little bit on that concept, um, or on both concepts. So so tell me yeah. about those. That was really fun. I am so excited for those looks to come out. I know this podcast will be released later, so it'll probably be released at the same time, but in this moment, it has not been released yet, so I have not seen it. And um, I did get to collaborate for the two looks, which is super fun because I don't usually get to do that either. And I loved them because, again, they're both very honest and truthful to me, but they're completely Completely, they completely juxtapose each other. They're almost stark opposites, but I I appreciated bringing life to both of them. The first one, um, I am a huge fan of colors in general. I like bright colors. I like cutesy, kawaii. Like my entire apartment basically just looks like a kindergarten classroom. Love colors, love cutesy things. So it was a whole candy inspired look. And I also love sugary, sweet phallic objects. So I had a lot of lollipops, a lot of things to put in my mouth. And I was surrounded by colors, wearing colors, um, super, super cutesy. I saw a couple uh, previews of the photos in the camera lens. And I think that shit's going to be really cute. Um, and the second one, totally opposite. I was wrapped in caution tape and we ended up finding this like metal scaffolding ladder and a metal chair. And we wrapped everything in chains and caution tape. And all I was wearing was caution tape and black panties and black boots 
holding chains, chains around my neck. So it was very, you go from something that's so full of life and, and vibrant to something that's, it makes you go, oh, this is, this is cool. Much, much darker, much more confined, I guess. I don't know if that's a great word for it. It makes sense in my head. But you see this person in an almost caricature version of themselves, and then you see them bound and much more polished um, and doing something completely different. All right, guys, we're going to take one last commercial break, and then we will be right back, and we're going to get into kinky sex fetishes and Brooklyn's first professional dom experience. So stick around. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies, they have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, they will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's Adam Eve. Dot com use code holly for 50 percent off of any one item plus 10 free gifts all right everybody we are back so let's get it right into it brooklyn you are well known for having some pretty kinky sex <sighs> fetishes which I know that you have been exploring more as of late so tell us a little bit about like some of your kinks and maybe why you enjoy them so much Oh, wow. That question really opens a lot of doors. <laughs> um, let's see. I I have been really getting into um, a lot of BDSM style kinks. And I've always, I've always been really open in terms of what I'm willing to do sexually. Like, even before I realized what kind of kinky things I'm into, I was always... I would always go into sex with the mindset of I will try just about anything once. And if I don't like it, I never have to do it again. There are certain things that I completely draw the line and I won't try, but there it's definitely less than a handful of things. But being in this industry and being with partners who are more comfortable in their sexuality and open with their kinks and sexuality, it's been it's been a huge eye opener for me to just be around these people and to, to see what people are doing that are sexual, but aren't really sexual. If that makes sense. Like sex is so much more than penetration or, or orgasm or what you think of typical vanilla sex as sex is also any sort of BDSM relationship, um, energy exchange or like, bondage is sex to a degree that's a type of sex that's just being tied up and being restrained and um my biggest things I I love to be tied up I like I like to be very submissive I have had experiences where I have been the more dominant one and while I enjoy and appreciate those moments it doesn't come as naturally to me as being um very submissive but aside from being spanked and like being choked and being told to do things, I have delved more into my BDSM sub side and I'm learning that I'm finding so many things that I didn't know that I was into. Like the first thing that comes to mind, I don't know why it's the first thing, but like puppy play, I... I love puppy play, like train me like I'm a puppy and put me in a dog crate. And it's, I, what is it for me? I love positive reinforcement and I appreciate when <laughs> doesn't everybody. <laughs> and I love. Yeah, but that's such like a, 
a one an unexpected example of such a thing. <laughs> well, okay, yes, but you get that negative energy and you get that I'm going to tell you what to do. You're going to do as I say or you're going to be punished. But when you do a good thing, it's like, oh, my God, you're so good. And there's something that feels so good about validation and positive reinforcement. So I think a lot of BDSM stuff comes down to comes down to to that. Like what um I want to say what do you need inside? It's you know what? I'm gonna stop there. It is a it's a what you need inside. Like sometimes I want to be trained like a puppy and told that I'm doing a really good job and maybe like treated poorly if I am disobedient. But that also goes for, um, I'm a huge masochist and I enjoy it when people bit the, beat the shit out of me consensually and when I'm in the mood for it. But sometimes that is what I need. Sometimes I don't need positive reinforcement. I don't need to be told how good I am. Sometimes I, wanna, I want to feel physical pain. And that is a huge release for me in a lot of ways. So BDSM kind of... Um, it gives you this safe space where you can talk to the the deepest parts of yourself and give that part of you what you need. Cause like I'm not gonna go to the, I'm not gonna go to the grocery store, hang up on myself, and like get that positive reinforcement that I need, or like feel physical pain, or being deprived of senses or deprived of attention. Like that's something that is is deeply needed and can only be given and found in a safe space, like a kink space. So I know that you've got some other kinks as well. Uh, what we would refer to in the industry as, I guess, water sports is something else that you're into, which basically is like playing with pee, I guess is the best way to put it, right? How would you describe it to people? Yeah, absolutely. I think of it as just piss play, how whatever that means to you. I have so many piss fantasies. Um, I've since I've been in the industry, I've found out that that is something that I'm very much interested in, and I think that that comes from a place of that comes from a very submissive place. Like I, I enjoy being consensually degraded, humiliated, that whole thing. So that's a for me when someone wants to piss on me or in me in any one of my many fun holes um I like to feel used I like to feel wanted in some way that isn't conventional I guess um but I'm actually in a new relationship with our friend Stella Smut and she is also very much into those things She's very much into water sports and BDSM, but speaking of water sports specifically, I've never been with someone who likes it as much as I do. And it's really cool to have new experiences with it where like it's reciprocated. Like I've had people piss in my mouth or piss on me and that's all fun and dandy. It's better when someone actually wants to do it. Not as fun when I just ask for it. But now I have someone who not only wants to piss on me, but also wants to be pissed on. And so I'm having fun switch flipping the script and having it being given and received on both ends. So where do you think that that comes from? Because I've like, I've never engaged in that. Um, have I? I don't think I have. But I, I, I definitely see the draw of it because I, I also like being degraded in bed. I mean, honestly, these days I'm so fucking vanilla um, just because I'm like older and I have a baby. But like back in the day, I was really into that. And I would always kind of think about like, why do I enjoy these things? Because, you know, in my day to day life, I am pretty strong. I run my own business. I have employees like I'm very much like in charge of everything. And so when it comes to being in the bedroom, I kind of like flipping that script and I like somebody else being in charge or something very freeing about it. But also like, why do, why do I love being degraded? Like, because, and I'm sure you'll agree, if you take those things out of context, if someone just walked up to you on the street and pissed on you, you'd like punch them in the face, right? But in that consensual safe space, there's something well, there's really a erotic huge about it. Yeah. 
But yeah, why do you consent think that is, is the most important part of any? Yeah. You know, this is something that fascinates me and has always fascinated me. I I really wish that I could if I was interested enough to like go to school for psychology, I would absolutely write some sort of dissertation on trauma throughout a lifetime and how that specifically correlates to your kinkiest sexual desires because I think that a lot of that comes from shit that's in your head for whatever reason. I think that a, a lot of deg- degradatory and humiliating things um come from wanting to to be exposed to that inner dialogue that's in your head from an external source. At least that's a big one for me. Like if I'm like being really shitty to myself in my head all the time, it's a lot nicer, I guess, to hear it from someone else and to like hear it with your ears and not just with your thoughts. Um, and it's, it's relieving. Like if I am feeling really bad at myself, if I'm like depressed or like having a lot of intrusive thoughts or whatever, and going through a weird time in my head, if I go to someone and I like pay a dom to beat the shit out of me and tell me all these terrible things about myself that I'm telling myself, but I don't hear outside of it. I feel like I get it out. Like it's, it's in your head and it's trapped in your head and it's just like whirring around in there. But once it's out, there is a, it's a bigger space for it and it leaves you alone. You know what I mean? That's, and it, yeah. That's so interesting. I never thought about it like that, but that makes a lot of sense because I too am very hard on myself and I often talk to myself in a way that's not nice. And I, I've always wondered why I enjoy being, because also too, like I only enjoy being degraded in bed if I know you don't mean it. Do you know what I mean? That it's only well, like yeah. a play thing. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it, it makes it more playful. Um, and also I think a huge part of, of kink and BDSM in general, at least on a submissive side. Um, I can't speak for the sadist side cause I don't identify, but um, at least from a submissive side, I feel like Oh my God. My thought just left my head. What was the last thing that you just said? I'm so sorry. Uh, just, uh, oh, wondering, wait, it came back to me. you know, so why sorry. we enjoy that. Um, <laughs> I think that a lot of the thing with BDSM is that it gives you a safe consensual space to experience things that have oppressed you in some way and to find power in those things. Hmm. So I I think that's a very good example of that. You're kind of like forced to to hear this bad dialogue about yourself in your head when you're being really hard on yourself. You're not feeling great for one reason or another. And when you take something that oppresses you in that way and you get it out and someone else does it to you and you get all of that energy out into a bigger space, it's no longer as oppressive. It's you have taken power over it you have the power instead of those thoughts having the power yeah it's like how something only has power over you if it's a secret if you like tell it to somebody else or you get it out and you talk about it it no longer holds that power over you yeah that's actually a perfect way to put it yeah so that's why i love actually working in this industry um among the many reasons but like human psychology is so complex and and strange and it it is it doesn't manifest itself in it manifests itself in a way through sexuality that it doesn't in other ways and so it's really interesting to kind of like see what different kinks people are into and kind of try to unpack why they're into those kinks and how that relates to their own personal psychology their their past their traumas their personality. It's just such like an interesting thing. So I love asking people what kind of kinks they're into for that reason. I'm like, what have you been through? What kind of a person are you? I want to know what you're into because then I can start to dissect from the inside out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay. So let's talk about you. So you had your first professional dom experience where you actually went to a professional dom who, um, 
did their thing with you. So tell us about that. That was absolutely the highlight of this recent year. Um, Stella got me a session as my birthday present and we actually did it together, which was very cool and, and felt a little safer. Um, I like that I got to experience it with someone because I wasn't really sure what I was walking into. Like I had an idea of what was going to happen, but it was also a completely unfamiliar experience to me. And I went to this dungeon and um, the Dom's name is Sir Rucifer. Rucifer is wonderful, magical, amazing. He could beat the shit out of me anytime. Um, But he's this very intense masculine energy and we got there and we kind of went over boundaries what we want to feel what we are okay with not okay with and he asked me a couple questions at the beginning that I I knew that I wanted to go in and feel pain and I knew that I wanted to be submissive and I knew like I know what I like but he asked me some questions that made me think a, a little bit deeper into that because he, I was telling him what I wanted. I was telling him, oh, I, I want pain. Like I want this kind of pain, but not this kind of pain. I want to feel dehumanized in this way. And he was like, what emotion do you want to feel by the end of this? And I was like, that I don't know. Like it's, it's interesting talking to someone who does it professionally because there's so much more um there's so much emotional uh, what's the word i'm looking for i guess there's just so much emotion and vulnerability that goes into it it's so much more than just someone hitting you and i i think mm-hmm. that this made me realize that more than i had in the past and um i told him what i wanted and then i took my clothes off he taught me six slave positions. So one, two, three, four, five, six, names a number, you get there, you do it, and then he'll do his thing. So right off the bat, I was being taught and told to do these things. I was fully naked, which makes it so much more vulnerable, obviously. And (laughs) oh man, there's just so much that happened. I'm like reeling still thinking about it. I, ah, oh, how do I even put this into words? Um, how did we start after I took my clothes off? I think he used me as a piece of furniture for a little bit and he hit me with a number of different things. There was one point, there was one thing that comes to mind specifically, which is like pretty hardcore, but I think was my favorite part of the session. He tied something around my neck that was sort of noose-like and pulled it pretty taut and took a blade, like a three or four inch blade and like traced my skin with it and was just telling me that I needed to be careful because if I moved, I could get seriously injured. And there's something about feeling unsafe, but in a ultimately safe space. I love I don't know why that does it for me. That's something I need to unpack with myself. But I like feeling like I'm in immediate danger. But again, knowing that I'm safe. Um, And I was was completely submissive. He walked me on a leash outside so that he could smoke a cigarette and ash in my mouth. And then walked me. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) That was the first time anyone had ashed in my mouth. And I have since done it many times. I also like that. Um, walked me back inside on a leash and told me to like bend over a sa- like a, a spanking bench and he used a cane on me. What fun things did I use? I got to be hit with a cane, which I never was hit with a cane before. I He used a flogger, which I'd been hit by a flogger, but not like that. Um, the blade. Oh, he put a plastic bag over my head. So that I was completely suffocated. That, I think, was the scariest thing that happened. Again, safe. And if I had called out my safe word, it would have been fine. But there was a point where I was hung, not hung, but pulled taut noose-like with a plastic bag over my head. 
And there were there were a few moments where I really couldn't breathe. I was actually suffocated. And that was the closest thing I've had to feeling truly out of control, which was a new and interesting experience. It's it's interesting because going into this, I knew that I was going to be very submissive and I was going to give all of this power to somebody. But it's so interesting to go into a space and put your life in the hands of an absolute stranger and feel comfortable enough mm-hmm. with that and find pleasure in that. And I also like that experience because I can have partners or people that I film content with do those things to me anytime I want, but I like that there's a disconnect in, there's a disconnect um, from any sort of emotional connection. This person, I don't know, this person is a complete stranger to me and all that they're there to do is to dominate me in the ways that I want. and. So there's no expectations, there's no emotional ties, there's no sexual contact whatsoever, and you're just literally handing someone the most vulnerable parts of yourself and letting them play with it like it's a toy. And then you go home and you probably don't talk to them again. We've since talked because I am an attention whore and I like to show him when I have marks (laughs) from any other experience I have. But it was a very new experience. It was it was a BDSM experience in a way that I've never I've never been in a space like that before and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, sounds like it. It's a lot. I mean, it sounds like fun. There's definitely a lot of things there that I would not I I don't think I could have pushed myself that far, but um I had a a boyfriend who was um a professional dom and we did a lot of BDSM stuff. We were together for about a year, but there was, there was a lot of things that he wanted me to do that I wasn't comfortable with. And we eventually hit a wall kind of where I was like, "Mm." I'm like this, I've had enough. And he was like, can we get a sex slave? And I was like, nah. And he's like, but if we get a sex slave, (laughs) like it was so funny the way he tried to talk me into it. He was like, but if we get a sex slave, she can like be like your assistant for free and like run errands for you and stuff. And I was like, nah, (laughs) But I thought about it for a second. I was like, Ooh, what yeah, that's a totally <laughs> different vibe. Yeah, I'm in my first relationship right now that I guess I would classify as a BDSM relationship because I feel like when you're into this kind of stuff and you're letting it translate into your relationship, mm-hmm. it's totally a completely different lifestyle. Like mm-hmm. I have obviously like. Stella and I are like normal most of the time we have like normal couple experiences like it's it's very wholesome and wonderful and like you get everything all the relationship things not just the BDSM part but when you're in a BDSM relationship Mm -hmm. there are opportunities to go really far and like we're currently exploring like maybe some sort of openness and like like I said going back to puppy play like I could just be a pet for a couple of days, like not necessarily be a partner, but be a pet for a couple of days and be put in a crate and being treated like that for a mm-hmm. few days. And also I, we've talked about um, lending each other out to be borrowed by people and then coming back. Like it's, there's a whole lot that goes into it um, aside from like the things that you want to experience in the bedroom, you know? It's yeah. a whole different. It's a uh, it's a much more like, ser- yeah, it's a much more cerebral kind of intimacy. Yes, um, it's yeah, definitely absolutely. very different than like your typical vanilla sex. So, um, Brooklyn, this has been really amazing, um, as I knew it would be. Um, super fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, spending some time with us. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yes, um, I can be found on Instagram at Brooklyn Blows. I can be found on Twitter at Brooklyn Gray XXX. And I can be found on OnlyFans at OnlyFans.com slash Brooklyn Gray XXX. Same as my Twitter handle, Gray spelled with an A. And for industry professionals, I can now be booked personally through my new booking email at book brooklyn gray at gmail.com 
And guys, just so you know, when she says that, she means literally like professional adult companies, not random guys who think she escorts because she doesn't. So I do uh, not. That's for industry professionals only. Yes. If you are a fan who would like to talk to me, my OnlyFans is the best place to do that. I'm always online chatting, but I will not respond to your emails letting you know that now. Yeah. Fair enough. I think that's fair (laughs) enough. And you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where we will be doing a bonus Q and a with Brooklyn right after this. Um, so if you want to get to know her a little bit better, make sure that you join my Patreon where you can access that perk and so many others. And then obviously, um, if you want to see her bombshell of the month content, go to hollyrandall.com or go to my YouTube channel, which maybe you're watching this on my YouTube channel right now, but her, uh, her quest bombshell of the month, uh, questions will be there too. I'm, this is like a month where I'm just asking Brooklyn a lot of questions. There's like three different places where you can like <laughs> learn more about Brooklyn, but you're such like an interesting multifaceted diverse character that I feel like I can't fit you all into one interview. So for me, it makes Thank sense. you. I like being <laughs> everywhere. Questions are fun. It's I'm having a great time with you, Holly. <laughs> thank you. Me as well. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week.